Thank you for downloading this episode of the ABR podcast. My name is Peter Rose, and I'm the editor of Australian Book Review. Each year, Australian Book Review offers a number of fellowships, each worth $7,500. The aim is to broaden our long-form journalism and to allow critics and commentators to spend several weeks or months on a substantive article. James McNamara was an ABR fellow in 2015. The title of his article was The Golden Age of Television, with a question mark at the end, as with many fine essays. James McNamara is an actor, screenwriter and critic. Here he is reading The Golden Age of Television. Hello and welcome to the Australian Book Reviews podcast series. I'm James McNamara and this is The Golden Age of Television, question mark. In 2013, US Ambassador Geoffrey Blyke asked Australians to stop pirating Game of Thrones. A single episode of HBO's gritty fantasy drama had been illegally downloaded over 4 million times, equaling the legitimate viewership of the program. As the ambassador here in Australia, Mr Blyke wrote, it was especially troubling to find out that Australian fans were some of the worst offenders, with among the highest piracy rates of Game of Thrones in the world. Sniggers about our penal heritage aside, this illustrates a wider cultural phenomenon, the rise of US television drama. Over the past decade and a half, since HBO's The Sopranos debuted in 1999, America has produced cable shows that elevated television to an art. Television moved from fast food entertainment, mind candy and producer Aaron Spelling's words, to a medium reviewed in highbrow literary journals and discussed with a passion and currency that literary fiction can only envy. American and British critics have lauded this period as the golden age of television, a revolution, citing slow-burning, serialised storytelling, dark, complex characters, exceptional production values, and the sheer addictive quality of it all. US television's engagement with 21st century social and political issues has seen it described by Andrew O'Hagan of the London Review of Books as becoming a national theatre of America, and by Academy Award-winning director Tom Hooper, as claiming the cultural prominence once held by British drama. HBO, he said, is presently fulfilling this role of public service broadcasting. Prominent creatives who once would have disdained the form have begun working in television. Baz Luhrmann is to direct and produce a show for Netflix, and Woody Allen will write and direct one for its competitor, Amazon. They follow Martin Scorsese, who directed and produced HBO's Boardwalk Empire. Major film festivals, Sundance, Tribeca, South by Southwest, have begun showing television and online series. Sundance founder Robert Redford said, My impression is television is advancing faster than major filmmaking. Novelists have moved to television as well. Salman Rushdie, Michael Chabon and Neil Gaiman are developing shows. And, as piracy statistics show, viewers watch US television drama. A lot. All over the world. Some critics have rightly queried television's coronation, arguing that previous eras had shows of great cultural and popular success, that television today still puts on dross watched by far greater numbers than the oft-lauded cable dramas, and that contemporary television, with audience fragmentation resulting from increasing numbers of channels, has lost the communality that defined it in earlier generations. Clearly, it is not the case that there was a lack of good television before The Sopranos, Shows like Brideshead Revisited, Pride and Prejudice, and the BBC's House of Cards quash that notion. Nor do I deny that there is rubbish on today. We live in an era of keeping up with the Kardashians. But I think the debate requires definition. Using television as an unqualified critical term is as unhelpful as using books when discussing literature, bundling car repair manuals and airport thrillers alongside Shakespeare. Rather, there's a specific type of television, US HBO-style cable drama, the literary fiction of television, that as a result of major changes to the ways we make and consume TV has yielded a new and heightened form of the medium. I want to consider the circumstances that generated this new television, examine some of the era's iconic shows and evaluate the cultural impact of the shift. My argument has necessary parameters. I begin with The Sopranos not because it came from nowhere. Other shows had made the revolution possible. Alan Seppenwall writes in The Revolution Was Televised. But The Sopranos is the one that made the world realise that something special was happening on television. 
I focus on cable shows because cable facilitated the artistic freedom needed for this new television drama. And this is not to deny network television's good work. Shows like The West Wing and Buffy the Vampire Slayer were iconic. Suits and The Good Wife are very strong. But they come from a different production model and, regardless of merit, largely do not demonstrate the qualities of the shows examined here. I don't look at comedy. As Brett Martin writes in Difficult Men, there wasn't the same disparity between network and cable comedy as there was in drama. I focus on the United States, not because it's the only country making good television, but because, with a highly developed cable market, it provided the nexus for economic, technological and artistic forces that aligned to change the trajectory of the medium. 20th century television was considered the poor cousin of film and the novel, a medium typified by populism, low production values, industry prejudice and critical disdain. In our glittering age of drama, this is, Martin writes, easy to forget. With the overwhelming majority of its existence, the idea that television was an artistic dead zone would have been self-evident. The main reason was commercial. 20th century American television was dominated by networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, which, broadcasting free to the public, relied on advertising to survive. The bigger the audience, the bigger the advertising revenues. Consequently, television demanded inoffensive content that appealed to the wider spectrum and didn't annoy advertisers. Outside theatre, the place for thinking person's drama was film. This changed in the late 1990s, though, as studios defunded the $40 to $50 million good drama movie. As screenwriter Sean Ryan said, television really grabbed that mantle. Enter HBO. HBO began as a small but innovative cable channel, supplying movies, stand-up comedy shows and live televised boxing. Towards the end of the 20th century, cable channels increased in number, audiences fragmented, and HBO needed something new. Cable differs from network television most practically in the method of transmission. Rather than broadcasting free to television antennae, cable transmits directly to subscribers via coaxial or fibre optic cables. Premium cable channels such as HBO don't rely on advertising revenues, but on viewers paying a monthly subscription to cable operators who own the physical cable infrastructure and collect packages of cable channels for viewers to choose. The cable operator pays a percentage of the viewer's subscription to the cable channel, and that, broadly, is how the channel makes money. Basic cable channels, such as AMC, maker of Mad Men and Breaking Bad, have some advertising content, but typically charge a smaller subscription fee. The higher the demand for a cable show, the more likely the channel producing it is to be bundled by cable operators into packages, thus generating the channel fees. Consequently, cable's business model works on appealing to vocal groups of affluent viewers who will stump up cash for entertainment. It doesn't prize countrywide ratings, as network television does. It relies, as AMC CEO Josh Sapan reportedly said, on a critically acclaimed and audience-craved show that would make us undroppable to cable operators. In 1999, cable companies' presence in original drama was minimal. HBO entered the market with quality as its distinctive product. Backed by its wealthy parent, Time Warner, they had little to lose. Carolyn Strauss, a founding drama executive and later president at HBO, recalls that it was loose. It was fun. We were still very much in the shadows. The fear doesn't creep in until you start winning Emmys. Whereas network executives are famously conservative and interventionist, HBO's risk-taking commissioning model has been called the HBO Shrug, or more bluntly, fuck it, let's do it, as Chris Albrecht, Strauss's former boss, said about agreeing to proceed with The Wire's later seasons. HBO gave creatives enormous freedom, allegedly delivering only two notes to The Sopranos. Ed Burns, co-creator of The Wire, said there's nobody blowing the whistle on the sidelines saying you can't do that. The founding creatives had a devil-may-care attitude. David Chase, creator of The Sopranos, didn't want to work in television. He disliked the medium, still does, and meant to leave it if The Sopranos failed. I didn't give a fuck about failing, he said. I had nothing to lose. David Simon, co-creator of The Wire, was a journalist and author with a similar approach. My attitude was, if this doesn't work, fuck it, I won't stay on TV. Happily for HBO, their risk and the creative's lack of inhibitions paid off. As well as artistic freedom, cable gave HBO another advantage, blood, sex and profanity. US networks are constrained by content regulations, cable is not. Game of Thrones showrunners David Benioff and D.B. Weiss told me by email that a friend of ours who works on a network show reported that standards and practices had recently banned the word crazy. How crazy is that? On cable it was a different story. 
In episode four of The Wire, as detectives Jimmy McNulty and Bunk Morland investigate a murder scene, their dialogue is almost composed entirely of the word fuck and its variants. Similarly, in Deadwood's pilot, Ellsworth remarks, I may have fucked up my life, flatter and hammered shit, but I stand here before you today beholden to no human cocksucker. Sex was present on cable too, in the girls of Tony Soprano's Butter Bing Strip Club, and basically any episode of Game of Thrones, a show that inspired the term sex position for delivering exposition via sex scenes. Violence was embraced in shows that killed off major characters, bloodily, and with breathless regularity. Although this content has been criticised for prurience, Game of Thrones in particular, it heightened realism and allowed shows to delve into darker and more sophisticated material. The censorship of the broadcast networks, Weiss and Benioff wrote, stifles innovation, experimentation and subversive behaviour. Vitally, Cable's grittier content enabled something never fully permissible on networks, the villain as protagonist. Tony Soprano, the fat fucking crook from New Jersey, Al Swearingen, the profane whoremonger of Deadwood, the wires broken, boozy detectives, Don Draper, Mad Men's adulterous ad man, Walter White, Breaking Bad's chemistry teacher turned drug baron, and the cutthroat would-be sovereigns in Game of Thrones. These characters were capable of more detailed investigation due to the rise of complex serialised narrative on cable. 20th century network television shows favoured complete storylines within each episode to cater for viewers who might not catch the show every week. The advance of cable, which repeated episodes, and the advent of DVD box sets in the early 2000s prompted serialisation, where each episode is a piece of a continuing story. In HBO's excellent True Detective, for example, an episode ends with detectives opening a door and begins with them walking through it in the next. Serialised storytelling demanded audience engagement in a way network television hadn't, making it difficult for a casual viewer to tune in. But with DVD box sets, viewers could watch and rewatch as they pleased and binge on a whole series, like reading a book, an attribute which has drawn contrasts to 19th century serialised novels. Distinguished writers confessed to neglecting the same in favour of a viewing frenzy, as David Carr described it. New York Times columnist Maureen Dowd admitted to hoping to get the flu so she could watch television uninterrupted. Online streaming services like Netflix have intensified this trend by releasing whole seasons at once. Narrative complexity was aided by changing season structures. A network television hour yields approximately 44 minutes of screen time. The rest is advertising. HBO's episodes ran uninterrupted for an hour. As Dean J. DeFino says in The HBO Effect, the typical 44-minute broadcast drama is broken into four acts by commercial break, and each act requires a climax, resolution, and cliffhanger to bridge the breaks. So much energy is spent on maximising dramatic impact around commercials that little is left to deepen the plot. But without the commercial intrusions imposing act breaks, HBO episodes allow for a full unbroken hour to weave narrative threads together into a cohesive whole. The number of episodes per season changed too. Network television typically broadcasts 22, requiring writers and crew to deliver material at a feverish pace. HBO cut this down to 12 or 13, allowing, as DeFino says, higher production values as crews had more time to compose shots and giving writers time to focus on complex narrative. At university in the early 2000s, I watched VHS tapes of Joss Whedon's terrific Buffy the Vampire Slayer on a boxy television. The screen was fuzzy, the sound muted. I remember the first time I saw a DVD, Braveheart, and being staggered by its picture quality. Advances in viewing technologies, flat screen digital televisions, Blu-ray discs, meant the TV, historically a dialogue-heavy medium, could adopt the sophisticated visual storytelling of cinema, long shots of the desert and Breaking Bad, the shadows of The Wire, CGI enhanced battles in Game of Thrones. In essence, there was no point in listing, as Vince Gilligan did for Breaking Bad, an Oscar-winning cinematographer to shoot your pilot without the equipment to display that level of craft. But now, one of cinema's main advantages was challenged. It relocated to the couch. Jack Warner, co-founder of Warner Brothers, famously dismissed screenwriters as schmucks with underwoods. In the director-centric movie industry, the writer was and remained something of a hired hand. In the movies, the writer is just the servant, the employee, Salman Rushdie said. In television, the writer is the primary creative artist. In 20th century TV, writers were in charge, but of a commercial product with a stigma. As cable champion quality, television writers' autonomy was joined with the means to produce art. As all-powerful showrunners, head writers and executive producers, television show creators have an authority akin to film directors, responsible, as Weiss and Benioff told me, not only for writing the show, but also for overseeing all the other departments. That means constantly reviewing VFX, score, edits, sound mix, etc. 
That means flying to London for casting sessions and driving around Northern Ireland looking at locations and meeting prospective directors in Los Angeles. Enabled by the experimental climate of cable companies' foray into original programming, showrunners took artistic and commercial risks. Their success established television as a serious writer's medium, drawing those who might otherwise have stayed in novels, the theatre and feature film. So, a series of economic, technological and artistic developments changed the television landscape dramatically in the past 15 years. We move from episodic network shows to serialisation on cable, from viewing at prescribed times to binging on DVDs and online. Heroes became villains in worlds grittier than anything we'd seen on networks, and new technologies allowed television to embrace the visual splendour of cinema. Aided by the increasing presence of heavyweight writers, the darker tone of the era's aesthetic generated biting social commentary, and it all began with a sweaty mob boss in northern New Jersey. The Sopranos. In 1999, television audiences were used to heroes. Certainly some were crusty, a hero could have the faintest hint of an edge, Seppenwall writes, but only if we were reminded early and often that he was ultimately pure at heart. The Sopranos changed that. Strauss recalls the discussion at HBO, could we have a show with a criminal as a protagonist? It seems like a quaint little argument now, but at the time it was huge. A poor sign, heavy breathing, Tony is a violent depressive mafia don. He's also a family man with a suburban mansion, a wife, Camilla, and children, Meadow and AJ. And he's suffering an existential crisis, in therapy for panic attacks that feel like ginger ale in my skull. The Sopranos was a reaction against network television. Pandering, cheerleading, family entertainment shit, creator David Chase called it. I don't know if you can tell from looking at The Sopranos, but I just had it up to here with all the niceties. Chase sought to unsettle audiences, and The Sopranos pilot foreshadows how he did that. We first see Tony vulnerable in his therapist Dr. Jennifer Melfi's waiting room. Then we meet his family in the Sopranos' kitchen. They watch Tony step into the pool, delighted that a family of ducks have returned. Later, Tony drives to work with his nephew, Christopher. Suddenly, he yanks the car off the street into a park and roars after a fleeing man. Tony grins. There's a boyish sense of rule-breaking. He guns the engine and runs the man over. Tony stands over his target. You all right? The man whimpers. My leg is broken. The bone's coming through. Tony says, let me see, let me see. Then smashes his fist into the wound. I'll give you a fucking bone, you prick. Where's my fucking money? So far, so controversial. But in episode five, college, television was transformed. While driving daughter Meadow to university campuses, Tony sees a former mob soldier, Fabian Petrullio, who ratted on his crew and sent mafia men to prison, one of whom, Jimmy, died. Between father-daughter dinners and Meadow's interviews, Tony drives to Petrullio's office. It's surrounded by woods. Birds sing. A deer steps between the trees. Then Tony puts a garrote around Petrullio's neck and strangles him. It isn't quick. Petrullio cries and begs. Tony spits, Jimmy says hello from hell, you fuck, and pulls harder. We have extreme close-ups of the victim's face, of Tony's face. Spittle flying, the clear exertion, the garrote cutting to Tony's hands, and then a corpse point of view shot as Tony lies, exhausted by the body. Then he picks up his daughter from Colby College. You ready? Don't want to be late for Bowden. As Mad Men creator Matthew Weiner commented, they just broke every rule in TV. During The Sopranos, our protagonist kills his best friend Pussy, his cousin Tony Blundetto, orders the murder of Christopher's fiancée, Adriana, and ultimately kills Christopher too. The Sopranos was, Emily Nussbaum wrote in New York Magazine, the first series that truly dared us to slam the door, to reject it. But we didn't. Like Dr. Melfi's response to Tony, we were fascinated, even as we were repelled. Throughout the series, the threads of violence, family and therapy intertwine, providing a complexity and empathy for Tony that straight mob drama wouldn't have achieved. James Gandolfini, who played Soprano, commented, You cared about Tony because David Chase was smart enough to write the Greek chorus through Dr. Melfi. So you got to see his motives, what he was thinking, what he was trying to do, what he was trying to fix, what he was trying to become. And then you saw it didn't really work out the way he wanted it to. By Tony's existential crisis, Chase communicates a bleak view of the United States. Christopher Bigsby writes in Viewing America that Tony is as much in search of meaning as Willie Lowman had been, with the same sense that he may have missed the point of his life. He is the middle manager of a failing company, a citizen of a country whose rhetoric is increasingly at odds with its reality. The kernel of the joke, Chase said, was that life in America had gotten so savage, basically selfish, that even a mob guy couldn't take it anymore. As well as psychobabble, I think The Sopranos describes American materialism, Chase commented. 
America has really big serious problems that are continually papered over with boosterism and escapism and money. It's all okay, so long as you're making money. The mafia, which provides Tony with a comfortable middle-class life, perversely extrapolates a faded American dream. Lately, Tony tells Dr. Melfi, I'm getting the feeling that I came in at the end. Many Americans feel that way, she replies. The Wire. HBO's next series, The Wire, departed as radically from network television as The Sopranos, not least because David Simon didn't envisage it as TV. I wanted the show to be a visual equivalent of literature, he said. While a journalist, Simon spent a year embedded with the Baltimore Police Department's homicide squad and with former detective Ed Burns, a year observing the drug trade in the projects. Simon came to believe that the war on drugs and untethered capitalism run amok had devastated inner cities. It marginalised a certain percentage of your population, he said, most of the minority, and placed them in a situation where the only viable economic engine in the hyper-segregated neighbourhoods is the drug trade. Simon shared Chase's view of network TV. I pitched the wire to HBO as the anti-cop show, he said, a rebellion of sorts against all the horseshit police procedurals. Network TV, with its foolish lumpy husbands, doctors and lawyers and super-powered heroes, is a reflection of who we actually wish ourselves to be. In The Wire, Simon embraced hyper-realism to portray the shadow land of the ghetto in the America that we have discarded politically, economically and emotionally to effectively argue its residents' relevance and existence to ordinary Americans. The Wire begins with an investigation into Avon Barksdale's drug business, inspired by a real-life case of Burns's. When Avon's nephew, D'Angelo, is acquitted of murder after witness intimidation, Detective McNulty, based on Burns, tells a judge that Baltimore's unsolved murders all trace back to Avon and his lieutenant, Stringer Bell. Following judicial pressure, senior police, angry to have a chunk of new murders now weighing down their statistics, assemble a token detail of departmental dregs. Some take the opportunity to do serious police work and begin surveillance on Barksdale's world. Through police cameras, Simon confronts us with the crack dens, drug trade and projects of Baltimore, filmed on location, often at real crime scenes. The actors were largely unknown and sometimes even criminals. Avon's real-life inspiration, Melvin Williams, played the deacon. Felicia Pearson, a murderer, played Snoop. The dialogue is difficult, the slung unexplained, and the scene relentlessly bleak. Not just the blood-soaked projects, but the cheap police officers. The railway tracks where McNulty and Bunk drink heavily and smash bottles. The narrative is slow and complex, establishing empathy for dealers as much as detectives which challenges traditional distinctions between good and evil. It was, as Simon says, a show that confounded and abused casual viewers. The Wire continually denies the simple gratification of hearing handcuffs click. At the end of season one, the investigation gets close to political leaders' murky campaign financing and is shut down prematurely by senior brass. As a result, Barksdale and Bell escape largely untouched. But the three lead detectives, Greggs, McNulty and Daniels, are respectively shot and have their careers ruined. In the projects, drugs keep flowing. Inspired by Balzac's Paris, Dickens's London and Tolstoy's Moscow, Simon made Baltimore the Wire's main character. From this, he drew wider claims about the national condition, using the streets and stories of one city as a microcosm. The grand theme here, he said, is nothing less than a national existentialism, an argument about why America can no longer even recognise its own problems, much less solve any of them. The next four seasons focus on the institutions stifling different parts of Baltimore. Political indifference ruining the stevedores in season two, mayoral politics quashing solutions to the drug problem in season three, education's failure in season four, and the press's deteriorating values in season five. In this portrait of a city, the wire reaches for Greek tragedy, arguing that America's postmodern institutions are the Olympian forces that crush individuals who challenge them. It reminds us, Simon said, that we're still fated by indifferent gods. Deadwood. The Sopranos had subverted and reimagined the gangster genre and the wire the police procedural. With Deadwood, HBO took on the Western. Its creator, David Milch, had a reputation. After being expelled from Yale Law School, he cites police, guns and drugs, Milch taught literature at Yale before moving to television. His working methods on Hill Street Blues and NYPD Blue were legendary. Periodically reliant on alcohol, gambling and heroin, Milch dictated lines to actors on set before shooting. Milch's unorthodox working methods continued on Deadwood. HBO, after the first four episodes, apparently never saw a script. 
based on the true story of a lawless 1870s gold mining town on Native American soil, Deadwood subverts the frontier myth of American manifest destiny. There's no tumbleweed, no strong-jawed cowboy. Milch's show is blood-soaked and profane. Its characters are filthy, covered in muck and animal shit, coats ripped, necklines grimy. You can nearly smell them from the screen. Slight provocations end in sudden executions. Bodies are fed to pigs. The series begins with Seth Bullock fulfilling his last commission as a Montana marshal. A baying, drunken crowd wants to lynch a horse thief whom Bullock has imprisoned, awaiting execution at dawn. Outnumbered, Bullock decides to hang the man now, lawfully, on a noose flung over the beams of his veranda. As the body twitches, Bullock hands over his badge, climbs onto his wagon, and leaves with his friend Sol Star to start a store in Deadwood. In the traditional Western, as Martin notes, Bullock would be the protagonist, yet in keeping with the rules of the new TV, he wasn't. Rather, in a town without law, saloon and brothel keeper Al Swearingen wields power and drives the dramatic action. He's not your average Western hero. In the initial episodes, Al beats a woman, abuses his disabled servant, and either murders or orders the deaths of three characters. One of his intended victims is a small girl who witnesses a massacre that might incriminate Al. Al isn't the only character who kills. Bullock and famed sharpshooter Wild Bill Hickok kill a man suspected of committing the massacre. In episode four, Jack McCall kills Wild Bill, a lead character for a gambling table slight. Aesthetically, Deadwood is as gritty as The Wire, with a death toll like The Sopranos. Its dialogue elevates cussing to a foul poetry not seen again until the thick of it. And yet, Seppenwell argues, while Deadwood takes place in the darkest, dirtiest, most frightening setting of the three classic HBO dramas of the period, it is also by far the most optimistic of the three. The Sopranos comes across as deeply cynical about humanity, while The Wire believes that any innate goodness within people eventually gets ground down by the institutions that they serve. They are shows about the end of the American dream. Deadwood is about the birth of it, about selfish loners existing on society's fringes, finding ways to come together in service of something greater than themselves. As the show continues, a form of law comes to Deadwood. Bullock reluctantly becomes sheriff and Al an unlikely civic leader, making strategic decisions about trying Wild Bill's murderer and later leading the town's response to plague. Eventually, Al assembles a government of sorts to press Deadwood's agenda with the United States. Through Deadwood's shift towards regulation and legitimacy via gold, corruption and murder, Milch offers a pungent study of early capitalist democracy and the foundations of the American dream. Mad Men In 1960, the American dream was alive and well and beginning to stale. AMC's Mad Men centres on Donald Draper, the suave, powerful creative director of Sterling Cooper, a fictional New York advertising agency. In a world of sharp suits, cigarettes and lunchtime old fashions, Don and his executives seem uniformly unhappy. But their job, advertising, as Don says, is based on one thing, happiness. Do you know what happiness is? Happiness is the smell of a new car. It's freedom from fear. It's a billboard on the side of the road that screams with reassurance that whatever you're doing is okay. You are okay. Via Don and his colleagues, Weiner shows the hollow core of gleaming consumerist America. In his professional life, Don sells Lucky Strike cigarettes, knowing they cause cancer, with the phrase... It's toasted, a slogan conjuring warmth, family, wholesome breakfasts. Later, he moves his audience to tears in a pitch to sell Kodak's revolving slide tray as Carousel. Showing pictures of his own family, Don says, It lets us travel the way a child travels, around and around and back home again to a place where we know we are loved. Don's family life seems perfect. A stately home, beautiful wife, rosy-cheeked children, bundles of cash. You have everything, his employee Peggy Olsen says, and so much of it. But these are symbols, externalities. Don likes the idea of family, but tires of the reality, often disappearing into booze, drugs, and compulsive affairs. Eventually, this breaks the family apart. Don embodies Mad Men's ironic distance between appearances and reality. As season one reveals, he is not really Donald Draper, a decorated former army officer, but Dick Whitman, the cowardly son of a prostitute from rural Pennsylvania who took his commanding officer's identity after he was killed in Korea. Don is as much a construct as the idealised America he sells. Literally, a self-made man. He is suffering as much of an existential crisis as Tony Soprano. There's no big lie, he says. There's no system. The universe is indifferent. Creator Matthew Weiner said that Don is someone like me, someone who was 35 years old and who had everything and who was miserable. John Hamm, who plays Don, notes that the 1960s typified this feeling. If you look at the literature, like Cheever and Updike, it's existentialist. People sitting around, smoking, thinking, what am I doing with my life? Post-war America was riding as high as it's ever ridden. 
Americans had money, ability to travel and see the world, and at the core of it was still, I'm still not happy. What Don Draper is doing is trying to sell happiness because he can't buy it himself. Weiner's painstaking recreation of the 1960s offers us life as lived in the era. Most apparent in the mise-en-scene and outdated attitudes, it is also conveyed in the treatment of women. The arc of Peggy, a bright, ambitious secretary who makes brutal sacrifices to become a copywriter, is juxtaposed against the childish former model, Betty Draper, who represents the idealised housewife. A house cat, as her father describes it in a dream. You're very important and you have little to do. Between them is Joan Holloway, a sexually confident office manager who attempts a stereotypical life as a wife but becomes a partner in the agency after agreeing to Pete Campbell's despicable suggestion. Mad Men's realism is augmented by historical moments that pepper the show. At times, these events draw the characters' focus, but usually they're peripheral, present only on background televisions. As Weiner said, If you're in the middle of a divorce and there's the Cuban Missile Crisis, eh, your problem is bigger. Mad Men has been criticised, notably by Mark Grief in the London Review of Books and Daniel Mendelssohn in the New York Review of Books, for being an unpleasant little entry in the genre of Now We Know Better and using visual allure to blind rather than enlighten. Despite those well-argued positions, it remains a subtle study of consumer culture and a period of change in American history. More broadly, as Chase said, Mad Men is about the real problems that regular everyday adults face. That is, money, marriage, bringing up children, power struggles in the office, career. To me, it is very much about American adulthood. Breaking Bad Breaking Bad's Walter White has a particularly American problem, a serious disease in the world's most expensive healthcare system. Diagnosed with incurable lung cancer, Walt, a struggling high school chemistry teacher, is too proud to take charity and unwilling to leave his pregnant wife and disabled son with vast debts. So he contacts Jesse Pinkman, a drug-peddling former student, and combines his scientific knowledge with Jesse's street smarts to produce crystal meth. Walt's first motivation is duty. He needs $737,000 before he dies to support his family. But Walt starts to enjoy the success of his flawless blue drug. It plays to his vanity and sense of lost genius. Previously a researcher, he sold his share in a tech company that later made his partners billionaires. Walt doesn't stop cooking meth when he reaches 737 grand. As his cancer goes into remission, his relish for his work increases. We realise that this man, who once sported a weak moustache and suffered his students' humiliations, has become his authentic self, the vicious, hyper-masculine drug baron Heisenberg. As James Meek writes in the London Review of Books, Walt is the Nietzschean superfluous man who believed himself to be good only because his claws were blunt. Vince Gilligan describes Breaking Bad as a guy transforming from a good law-abiding citizen to drug kingpin. It is the story of metamorphosis, and metamorphosis in real life is slow. Gilligan utilised the structural advantages of serialised television to convey a story about the in-between moments. I think we've all seen the big moments in any crime story, he said. You can't top a movie like The Godfather, so what can I do as a filmmaker? At least I can show the stuff that nobody else bothers to show. Carefully, incrementally, Breaking Bad positions the audience as an ordinary person learning to distribute drugs, rationalise murder, and dismember a corpse, and shows the resulting erosion of Walt's familial and romantic relationships. And it does so in visual splendour, with cinematography that set a new bar for television. Gilligan, Martin writes, took advantage of better TVs and higher budgets to move away from restrictions imposed by the old grainy square box. Establishing shot, close up, close up, establishing shot, close up, close up, camera always on who was speaking, everything flooded with light. Breaking Bad has non-traditional camera angles and shots from the point of view of objects. Time lapse, overcranking, undercranking, jump shots and symbolic use of extreme close ups, notably on a charred stuffed toy in Walt's pool representing a mid-air collision precipitated by Walt's actions. Most glorious are the long shots of Walt and Jesse's RV drug lab against the New Mexican desert, an ironic callback to pioneer wagons and the promise of manifest destiny. Michael Slovis, director of photography on 20 episodes, said, I have been given an extraordinary amount of freedom, never before seen by me in television, and very rarely given to anybody. It was well used. Although focused on crime's interstices, Breaking Bad is far from dull, That Walt's adversary is his own essentially likeable brother-in-law, DEA agent Hank Schrader, adds nuance. Episode after episode, Gilligan pressurises his scenes, putting Walt and Jesse into seemingly inescapable corners, often on the cusp of death or discovery by Hank. He leaves the audience eyes wide on the edge of the proverbial seat. As Brian Cranston, who played Walt, said of Gilligan's pilot script, I picked it up and read, A guy in tidy whitey underwear. He's got a respirator on. He's driving in Winnebago. 
two dead bodies are sliding back and forth. And I'm like, what the fuck? What? What? And I had to catch up. And that was his lure. Before you know it, you're engrossed. Game of Thrones. Unlike crime, fantasy is a polarising genre with an undeserved reputation, as novelist Lisa Tuttle describes it, for twee escapism involving fairies. Game of Thrones, lewd, muddy and staggeringly violent, rips the throat out of that prejudice and brings fantasy to mainstream TV audiences. We wanted the show to appeal to people who don't consider themselves fantasy fans, Weiss and Benioff told me. For instance, our wives. Based on George R. R. Martin's novels, David Benioff and D.B. Weiss's HBO adaptation charts the machinations of the great houses of the Seven Kingdoms in the imagined medieval land of Westeros. It is gritty fantasy, a supposedly realist world privileging political strategy and human conflict over dragons and wizards. The series kicks off with Ned Stark, Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North, receiving his best friend and former comrade-in-arms, King Robert Baratheon, at the Stark's holdfast. The King's Hand, a Prime Minister of sorts, is dead, and Robert wants Ned to fill the role. During the King's visit, Ned's ten-year-old son Bran, an avid climber, scales a tower. Reaching a high window, he sees Robert's bodyguard, Sir Jamie Lannister, having sex with Cersei. Cersei is Robert's queen, and Jamie's sister. Seeing Bran, Jamie turns to the window and with a dry aside, the things I do for love, pushes Bran to his apparent death. Now that combination of sex, violence and brutal means to political ends, preserving House Lannister from scandal, typifies Game of Thrones. Jamie's unsuccessful murder attempt on Bran sparks a conflict that fires a civil war when Cersei arranges Robert's assassination and puts her teenage son, Prince Joffrey, on the throne. Joffrey is not Robert's son, but Jamie's and Cersei's. When Ned discovers and reveals this knowledge, giving Cersei a chance to leave the capital with Joffrey, Cersei locks Ned up. Then, in the ninth episode, Joffrey lops off his head. The death of Ned, previously the show's lead character, marked Game of Thrones as more ruthless still than HBO's other series. Once Ned dies, Weiss said, it completely changes the landscape of the world. It means that when a character's in jeopardy, the jeopardy becomes real. As main characters continue to die, Game of Thrones delivers a thrill of realism, something aided by the show's moral ambiguity and essentially human struggles. The audience reaction to Ned's death, or the deaths of multiple leads at the Red Wedding, was not dependent on magic or monsters, Weiss and Benioff emailed. The truth is, regardless of genre, a show only succeeds if people care about the characters. Here, there is no epic conflict of good and evil, Benioff said. There are multiple protagonists with complex and opposing objectives, and the audience roots for certain characters on either side. Although we notionally align with the Starks, we empathise with their enemies, the Lannisters. Jaime later shows an essential nobility. His younger brother Tyrion, a droll, politically savvy booze hound, becomes a focal point. And all characters are driven not by abstract concepts of good and evil, but by the messy motivations of love, revenge, ambition and hate. Authentic character motivations fuel the show's political realism, something augmented by the detail of Martin's world and its basis in the War of the Roses. Although Weiss and Benioff expressly disclaim political allegory, the Seven Kingdoms focus on internecine power struggles in the face of impending catastrophe, the rise of the White Walkers, reanimated dead from across the wall dividing the kingdom from its icy north, and the dragons of Daenerys Targaryen, the would-be queen of the Seven Kingdoms is widely noted as a nod to climate change. Westeros's lack of political stability and moral pluralism strikes a chord with a dark turn of international politics post 9-11 and the global financial crisis. Game of Thrones could only exist on cable, a network, Weiss and Benioff told me, never would have allowed us to adapt Game of Thrones with the pronounced sexuality and violence that define the books. They never would have allowed us to kill the leading man in the first season. It is also a distinctly HBO product. When Benioff and Weiss pitched it, they said, this is what you guys do, whether it's taking the cop show with The Wire or gangster shows with The Sopranos and making them dirty and reinventing them. But no one had really done fantasy in that way. HBO was the sole channel, with the resources to do it on this scale, Benioff added. Despite Game of Thrones' dramatic focus on discreetly human issues, it is a massive production, shooting on multiple international locations and choreographing the sort of CGI augmented land and sea battles traditionally reserved for the big screen, television moved to the scale of epic cinema. In Game of Thrones, the trends of this era cohere. The anti-hero became anti-heroes and anti-heroines. 
There was more sex and violence than ever. The complexity of serialized storytelling reached new levels as writers managed the interlocking stories of multiple protagonists. Morality was defined only by ambiguity. Production values reached heights of cinematic spectacle and a disregarded genre was pushed into a textured human drama that was critically acclaimed, commercially successful and delivered wider social comment. These shows are not the only excellent television dramas, but they exemplify the radical shifts in the medium since 1999. In making them, showrunners and executives harnessed economic, technological and artistic changes to turn television into an art. The shows they produced are lauded as amongst the best television ever made and recognised as modern classics that stand alongside great films and literature. That success drew Academy Award winning feature filmmakers and Pulitzer and Booker Prize winning playwrights and novelists towards television. From The Sopranos to Deadwood, from The Wire to Breaking Bad, the most memorable characters created on the screen in the last 15 years or so have been on the small screen. Which movie character during that time span, Weeson Benioff asked me, has become a part of the cultural imagination in the manner of Tony Soprano or Walter White? This, then, is a golden age of television. But what does that mean for Western culture more broadly? Is the open-ended 12 or 13 episode serialised drama, as Martin argues, the dominant art form of the era? the equivalent of what the films of Scorsese, Altman, Coppola and others had been to the 1970s, or novels of Updike, Roth and Mailer had been to the 1960s, as Martin maintains. Measuring a form's dominance is tricky and subjective. There are no concrete matrices. Viewing figures and commercial returns are not dispositive of cultural impact. Certainly in terms of numbers, Weiss and Benioff emailed, far more people are playing the video games Call of Duty or World of Warcraft than are watching television. Dominance is not, I think, the most helpful critical term. Art isn't a competition. HBO-style television enjoys a prominence today because it unites critical acclaim, artistic excellence, and broad popular appeal in a way that films and literary fiction currently don't. It reminds us that entertainment can be art, and art can entertain. And this is, I think, the measure of greatness. Art can survive on the fumes of critics alone, but the greatest works resonate with the public too. Romeo and Juliet, Pride and Prejudice, Beowulf. In the narrative arts, that resonance comes down to story, driven by character, beginnings, middles and ends, catharsis and empathy, the dramatic foundations of Aristotle's poetics. Humans consume stories with vigorous need. They define us, teach us and communicate our inner experience. In the main, HBO-style television is delivering better, tighter storytelling than any other form because of the nature of its medium. TV producers need a returning audience to make money, so television has to be addictive. Also, TV is expensive. Game of Thrones averages $6 million an episode. So when a show costs hundred grand a minute, each new scene, location or actor on set has to be justified. These factors lead to rigorous application of story principles. As well as visual, thematic and verbal artistry, showrunners deliver honed economic storytelling, character arcs that generate empathy, tight plots that causally escalate obstacles and stakes. Film, subject to similar pressures, is challenged by the longer narrative space of television, although movies like The Theory of Everything reinforce how reductive it is to write off contemporary film as superhero escapism. Literary fiction often disdains story as the province of plot-driven commercial novels. Television doesn't. It can't afford to. The great television dramas of this era were reviewed alongside novels and senior literary publications, and, as David Carr wrote, shifted the cultural conversation at New York Times dinner tables from books and movies to television. But they also generated obsessive online recaps, amateur reviews and fan websites. That critical legitimacy and popular reach enabled cable drama to observe this dark era of America with more impact than other forms, echoing 19th century fiction's comment on industry and F. Scott Fitzgerald's picture of the dark beneath the sheen of the roaring 20s. The 21st century began with a disputed presidential election and an appalling attack on New York. The West invaded Iraq on shaky evidence, and warfare changed as we fought an irrational, non-governmental enemy in Afghanistan. Lawyers split hairs over appropriate forms of torture. Financial institutions fell. Those that survived no longer seemed secure or trustworthy. Whole economies turned out to be based on nothing, and taxpayers suffered because loosely regulated banks grew too big to fail. Ideas of justice, security, economic opportunity, and democratic franchise were destabilised. The cable dramas of this era are bleak defying easy resolution or interpretation, and resisting the restorative narratives of authority figures correcting social aberrations. They articulate fear, cynicism, and a feeling that aspirants to the American dream have been shortchanged. Theatre excludes many. $85 for two hours at the theatre buys you more than 20 hours of HBO. 
Literary fiction's readership declines, and movies increasingly favour big-budget franchises. But TV, addictive, more consumable than ever on tablets and smartphones, uniquely suited to explore nuanced social issues via long-form, serialised narratives, best communicates our lost bearings, our gloomier world. So, what next for television? As multi-screen viewing proliferates, so watching on one and live tweeting on another screen, and as online providers increase their presence, television drama's traditional parameters, one screen, one hour, non-interactive, may change. The next step has to be more female protagonists. Save for the multi-protagonist Game of Thrones, the absence of leading women in these shows, all created by male showrunners and about difficult men, as Martin puts it, means that this could only be a golden age, not the golden age. Certainly, there are textured female characters. Camilla Soprano, Kina Griggs, Alma Garrett, Peggy Olsen, Skylar White. Netflix's House of Cards has Claire Underwood, Lady Macbeth to her husband Francis. But these are all supporting leads. Showtime's political thriller Homeland has a female protagonist in CIA operative Carrie Matheson, but bipolar disorder and love are used to generate moments of perceived weakness in a way unhelpful both to the study of female authority and to bipolar sufferers. Alan Ball's vampire dramedy, True Blood, centres on Suki Stackhouse, a part fairy Louisiana waitress. It started well but turned increasingly bizarre. And even though it runs for nearly an hour, Orange is the New Black, the excellent female-centred prison story, was classified as a comedy by the TV Academy until February of 2015. Lena Dunham's patchily brilliant Girls is structured as a half-hour comedy, but crosses humour with darkness in a way The Sopranos did. It could have been classified drama, with a 60-minute time slot that affords, but it wasn't. Lily Lufbrow, writing in the New York Times, argued recently that female protagonists will define television's next era. When that gender imbalance is redressed, I'll say we're in the golden age. I'm James McNamara. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, consider subscribing to the magazine. A full list of subscription options appears on our website. Australian Book Review is a cultural magazine with broad interests and an international readership. We publish essays, book reviews, interviews, travel writing and creative writing, as well as reviews of film, theatre, music, dance and the visual arts, all available freely via Arts Update on our website. Australian Book Review also offers a range of literary prizes and programs unique to this magazine. You can find out more about the magazine on our website, australianbookreview.com.au. Follow us on Twitter, at Aust Book Review, or like us on Facebook. You can also sign up to our free e-bulletins on the website, to keep up to date with all the latest news from ABR. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review on iTunes.